Introduction of Meno. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read for you by Chiquito Crasto. Meno by Plato. Translated by Benjamin Jowett. Introduction. This dialogue begins abruptly with a question of Meno, who asks, Whether virtue can be taught? Socrates replies that he does not as yet know what virtue is, and has never known any one who did. Then he cannot have met Gorgias when he was at Athens. Yes, Socrates had met him, but he has a bad memory, and has forgotten what Gorgias said. Will Meno tell him his own notion, which is probably not very different from that of Gorgias? Oh yes, nothing easier. There is the virtue of a man, of a woman, of an old man, and of a child. There is a virtue of every age and state of life, all of which may be easily described. Socrates reminds Meno that this is only an enumeration of the virtues, and not a definition of the notion which is common to them all. In a second attempt, Meno defines virtue to be the power of command. But to this, again, exceptions are taken. For there must be a virtue of those who obey, as well as of those who command. And the power of command must be justly or not unjustly exercised. Meno is very ready to admit that justice is virtue. Would you say virtue or a virtue? For there are other virtues, such as courage, temperance, and the like. Just as round is a figure, and black and white are colors, and yet there are other figures and other colors. Let Meno take the examples of figure and color, and try to define them. Meno confesses his inability, and after a process of interrogation, in which Socrates explains to him the nature of a simile in Maltese, Socrates himself defines figure as the accompaniment of color. But someone may object that he does not know the meaning of the word color, and if he is a candid friend and not a mere disputant, Socrates is willing to furnish him with a simpler and more philosophical definition into which no disputed word is allowed to intrude. Figure is the limit of form. Mino imperiously insists that he must still have a definition of color. Some raillery follows, and at length Socrates is induced to reply that color is the effluence of form, sensible and in due proportion to the sight. This definition is exactly suited to the taste of Meno, who welcomes the familiar language of Gorgias and Empedocles. Socrates is of the opinion that the more abstract or dialectical definition of figure is far better. Now that Meno has been made to understand the nature of a general definition, he answers in the spirit of a Greek gentleman, and in the words of a poet, that virtue is to delight in things honourable, and to have the power of getting them. This is a nearer approximation than he has yet made to a complete definition, and regarded as a piece of proverbial or popular morality, is not far from the truth. But the objection is urged that the honourable is the good, and as every one equally desires the good, the point of the definition is contained in the words, the power of getting them, and they must be got justly or with justice. The definition will then stand thus, virtue is the power of getting good with justice, but justice is a part of virtue, and therefore virtue is the getting of good with a part of virtue. The definition repeats the word defined. Mino complains that the conversation of Socrates has the effect of a torpedo's shock upon him. When he talks with other persons, he has plenty to say about virtue. In the presence of Socrates, his thoughts desert him. Socrates replies 
that he is only the cause of perplexity in others because he is himself perplexed he proposes to continue the enquiry but how asks meno can he enquire either into what he knows or into what he does not know this is a sophisticated puzzle which as socrates remarks saves a great deal of trouble to him who accepts it but the puzzle has a real difficulty latent under it to which socrates will endeavor to find a reply the difficulty is the origin of knowledge he has heard from priests and priestesses and from the poet pindar of an immortal soul which is born again and again in successive periods of existence returning into this world where she has paid the penalty of ancient crime and having wandered over all places of the upper and under world and seen and known all things at one time or other is by association out of one thing capable of recovering all for nature is of one kindred and every soul has a seed or germ which may be developed into all knowledge the existence of this latent knowledge is further proved by the interrogation of one of meno's slaves who in the skilful hands of socrates is made to acknowledge some elementary relations of geometrical figures the theorem that the square of the diagonal is double the square of the side that famous discovery of primitive mathematics in honor of which the legendary pythagoras is said to have sacrificed a hecatomb is elicited from him the first step in the process of teaching has made him conscious of his own ignorance he has had the torpedo shock given him and is the better for the operation but whence had the uneducated man this knowledge he had never learned geometry in this world nor was it born with him he must therefore have had it when he was not a man and as he always either was or was not a man he must have always had it compare phaedo after socrates has given the specimen of the true nature of teaching the original question of the teachableness of virtue is renewed again he professes a desire to know what virtue is first but he is willing to argue the question as mathematicians say under an hypothesis he will assume that if virtue is knowledge then virtue can be taught this was the stage of the argument at which protagoras concluded socrates has no difficulty in showing that virtue is good and that goods whether of body or mind must be under the direction of knowledge upon the assumption just made then virtue is teachable but where are the teachers there are none to be found this is extremely discouraging virtue is no sooner discovered to be teachable than the discovery follows that it is not taught virtue therefore is and is not teachable in this dilemma an appeal is made to anytus a respectable and well-to-do citizen of the old school and a family friend of meno who happens to be present he is asked whether meno shall go to the sophists and be taught the suggestion throws him into a rage to whom then shall meno go asks socrates to any athenian gentleman to the great athenian statesman of past times socrates replies here as elsewhere lashes protagoras that themistocles pericles and other great men had sons to whom they would surely if they could have done so have imparted their own political wisdom but no one ever heard that these sons of theirs were remarkable for anything except riding and wrestling and similar accomplishments anytus is angry at the imputation which is cast on his favorite statesman and on a class to which he supposes himself to belong he breaks off with a significant hint the mention of another opportunity of talking with him and the suggestion that meno may do the athenian people a service by pacifying him are evident allusions to the trial of socrates socrates returns to the consideration of the question whether virtue is teachable which was denied on the ground that there are no teachers of it for the sophists are bad teachers and the rest of the world do not profess to teach but there is another point which we fail to observe and in which gorgias has never instructed meno nor prodicus socrates this is the nature of right opinion 
for virtue may be under the guidance of right opinion as well as of knowledge and right opinion is for practical purposes as good as knowledge but is incapable of being taught and is also liable like the images of daedalus to walk off because not bound by the tie of the cause this is the sort of instinct which is possessed by statesmen who are not wise or knowing persons but only inspired or divine the higher virtue which is identical with knowledge is an ideal only if the statesman had this knowledge and could teach what he knew he would be like tiresias in the world below he alone has wisdom but the rest flit like shadows this dialogue is an attempt to answer the question can virtue be taught no one would either ask or answer such a question in modern times but in the age of socrates it was only by an effort that the mind could rise to a general notion of virtue as distinct from the particular virtues of courage liberality and the like and when a hazy conception of this ideal was attained it was only by a further effort that the question of the teachableness of virtue could be resolved the answer which is given by plato is paradoxical enough and seems rather intended to stimulate than to satisfy enquiry virtue is knowledge and therefore virtue can be taught but virtue is not taught and therefore in this higher and ideal sense there is no virtue and no knowledge the teaching of the sophists is confessedly inadequate and meno who is their pupil is ignorant of the very nature of general terms he can only produce out of their armory the sophism that you can neither enquire into what you know nor into what you do not know to which socrates replies by his theory of reminiscence to the doctrine that virtue is knowledge plato has been constantly tending in the previous dialogues but the new truth is no sooner found than it vanishes away if there is knowledge there must be teachers and where are the teachers there is no knowledge in the higher sense of systematic connected reasoned knowledge such as may one day be attained and such as plato himself seems to see in some far-off vision of a single science and there are no teachers in the higher sense of the word that is to say no real teachers who will arouse the spirit of enquiry in their pupils and not merely instruct them in rhetoric or impart to them ready-made information for a fee of one or of fifty drachms plato is desirous of deepening the notion of education and therefore he asserts the paradox that there are no educators this paradox though different in form is not really different from the remark which is often made in modern times by those who would depreciate either the methods of education commonly employed or the standard attained that there is no true education among us there remains a still a possibility which must not be overlooked even if there be no true knowledge as is proved by the wretched state of education there may be right opinion which is a sort of guessing or divination resting on no knowledge of causes and incommunicable to others this is the gift which our statesmen have as is proved by the circumstance that they are unable to impart their knowledge to their sons those who are possessed of it cannot be said to be men of science or philosophers but they are inspired and divine there may be some trace of irony in this curious passage which forms the concluding portion of the dialogue but plato certainly does not mean to intimate that the supernatural or divine is the true basis of human life to him knowledge if only attainable in this world is of all things the most divine yet like other philosophers he is willing to admit that probability is the guide of life butler's analogy and he is at the same time desirous of contrasting the wisdom which governs the world with a higher wisdom there are many instincts judgments and anticipations of the human mind which cannot be reduced to rule and of which the grounds cannot always be given in words a person may have some skill or latent experience which he is able to use himself and is yet unable to teach others because he has no principles and is incapable of collecting or arranging his ideas he has practice but not theory art but not science this is a true fact of psychology which is recognized by plato in this passage but he is far from saying as some have imagined that inspiration or divine grace is to be regarded as higher than knowledge 
he would not have preferred the poet or man of action to the philosopher or the virtue of custom to the virtue based upon ideas also here as in the eon and phaedrus plato appears to acknowledge an unreasoning element in the higher nature of man the philosopher only has knowledge and yet the statesman and the poet are inspired there may be a sort of irony in regarding in this way the gifts of genius but there is no reason to suppose that he is deriding them any more than he is deriding the phenomena of love or of enthusiasm in the symposium or of oracles in the apology or of divine intimations when he is speaking of the demonium of socrates he recognizes the lower form of right opinion as well as the higher one of science in the spirit of one who desires to include in his philosophy every aspect of human life just as he recognizes the existence of popular opinion as a fact and the sophists as the expression of it this dialogue contains the first intimation of the doctrine of reminiscence and of the immortality of the soul the proof is very slight even slighter than in the phaedo and republic because men had abstract ideas in a previous state they must have always had them and their souls therefore must have always existed for they must always have been either men or not men the fallacy of the latter words is transparent and socrates himself appears to be conscious of their weakness for he adds immediately afterwards i have said some things of which i am not altogether confident compare phaedo it may be observed however that the fanciful notion of pre-existence is combined with a true but partial view of the origin and unity of knowledge and of the association of ideas knowledge is prior to any particular knowledge and exists not in the previous state of the individual but of the race it is potential not actual and can only be appropriated by strenuous exertion the idealism of plato is here presented in a less developed form than in the phaedo or phaedrus nothing is said of the pre-existence of ideas of justice temperance and the like nor is socrates positive of anything but the duty of enquiry the doctrine of reminiscence too is explained more in accordance with fact and experience as arising out of the affinities of nature ate tes thusios oles sugenios ausis modern philosophy says that all things in nature are dependent on one another the ancient philosopher had the same truth latent in his mind when he affirmed that out of one thing all the rest may be recovered the subjective is converted by him into an objective the mental phenomenon of the association of ideas compare phaedo became a real chain of existences the germs of two valuable principles of education may also be gathered from the words of priests and priestesses one that true knowledge is a knowledge of causes compare aristotle's theory of episteme and two that the process of learning consists not in what is brought to the learner but in what is drawn out of him some lesser points of the dialogue may be noted such as one the acute observation that mino prefers the familiar definition which is embellished with poetical language to the better and truer one or two the shrewd reflection which may admit of an application to modern as well as to ancient teachers that the sophists having made large fortunes this must surely be a criterion of their powers of teaching for that no man could get a living by shoemaking who was not a good shoemaker or three the remark conveyed almost in a word that the verbal sceptic is saved the labor of thought and enquiry odin dai to toyoto zetesios characteristic also of the temper of the socratic enquiry is four the proposal to discuss the teachableness of virtue under an hypothesis after the manner of the mathematician and five the repetition of the favorite doctrine which occurs so frequently in the earlier and more socratic dialogues and gives a color to all of them that mankind only desire evil through ignorance six the experiment of eliciting from the slave boy the mathematical truth which is latent in him and seven the remark that he is all the better for knowing his ignorance the character of mino like that of critias has no relation to the actual circumstances of his life 
Plato is silent about his treachery to the ten thousand Greeks which Xenophon has recorded, as he is also silent about the crimes of Critias. He is a Thessalian Alcibiades, rich and luxurious, a spoiled child of fortune, and is described as the hereditary friend of the great king. Like Alcibiades, he is inspired with an ardent desire of knowledge and is equally willing to learn of Socrates and of the Sophists. He may be regarded as tending in the same relation to Gorgias as Hippocrates in the Protagoras to the other great Sophist. He is the sophisticated youth on whom Socrates tries his cross-examining powers, just as in the Charmides, the Lysus, and the Euthydemus, ingenuous boyhood is made the subject of a similar experiment. He is treated by Socrates in a half-playful manner suited to his character. At the same time he appears not quite to understand the process to which he is being subjected. For he is exhibited as ignorant of the very elements of dialectics in which the sophists have failed to instruct their disciple. His definition of virtue as the power and desire of attaining things honourable, like the first definition of justice in the Republic, is taken from a poet. His answers have a sophisticated ring, and at the same time show the sophistical incapacity to grasp a general notion. Anitus is the type of the narrow-minded man of the world who is indignant at innovation, and equally detests the popular teacher and the true philosopher. He seems, like Aristophanes, to regard the new opinions, whether of Socrates or the Sophists, as fatal to Athenian greatness. He is of the same class as Callicles in the Gorgias, but of a different variety. The immoral and sophistical doctrines of Callicles are not attributed to him. The moderation with which he is described is remarkable. If he be the accuser of Socrates, as is apparently indicated by his parting words, perhaps Plato may have been desirous of showing that the accusation of Socrates was not to be attributed to badness or malevolence, but rather to a tendency in men's minds. Or he may have been regardless of the historical truth of the characters of his dialogue, as in the case of Mino and Critias, like Chaerophon, a Paul. The real Anitus was a democrat, and had joined Thrasybulus in the conflict with the Thirty. The Protagoras arrived at a sort of hypothetical conclusion, that if virtue is knowledge it can be taught. In the Euthydemus, Socrates himself offered an example of the manner in which the true teacher may draw out the mind of youth. This was in contrast to the quibbling follies of the sophists. In the Meno, the subject is more developed. The foundations of the enquiry are laid deeper, and the nature of knowledge is more distinctly explained. There is a progression by antagonism of two opposite aspects of philosophy. But at the moment when we approach nearest, the truth doubles upon us and passes out of our reach. We seem to find that the ideal of knowledge is irreconcilable with experience. In human life there is indeed the profession of knowledge, but right opinion is our actual guide. There is another sort of progress from the general notions of Socrates who asked simply, what is friendship, what is temperance, what is courage, as in the Lysis, Charmides, Lashes, to the transcendentalism of Plato, who in the second stage of his philosophy sought to find the nature of knowledge in a prior and future state of existence. The difficulty in framing general notions which has appeared in this and in all the previous dialogues recurs in the Gorgias and the Thetetus, as well as in the Republic. In the Gorgias, too, the statesmen reappear, but in stronger opposition to the philosopher. They are no longer allowed to be a divine insight, but though acknowledged to have been clever men and good speakers, are denounced as blind leaders of the blind. The doctrine of the immortality of the soul is also carried further, being made the foundation not only of a theory of knowledge, but of a doctrine of rewards and punishments. In the Republic, the relation of knowledge to virtue is described in a manner more consistent with modern distinctions. The existence of the virtues without the possession of knowledge in the higher or philosophical sense is admitted to be possible. Right opinion is again introduced in the Thetetus as an account of knowledge, but is rejected on the ground that it is irrational, as here, because it is not bound by the tie of the cause. 
and also because the conception of false opinion is given up as hopeless. The doctrines of Plato are necessarily different at different times of his life, as new distinctions are realized or new stages of thought attained by him. We are not therefore justified in order to take away the appearance of inconsistency in attributing to him hidden meanings or remote illusions. There are no external criteria by which we can determine the date of the Mino. There is no reason to suppose that any of the dialogues of Plato were written before the death of Socrates. The Mino, which appears to be one of the earliest of them, is proved to have been of a later date by the illusion of Anitus. We cannot argue that Plato was more likely to have written, as he has done, of Mino before than after his miserable death, for we have already seen, in the examples of Charmides and Critias, that the characters in Plato are very far from resembling the same characters in history. The repulsive picture which is given of him in the Anabasis of Xenophon, where he also appears as a friend of Aristippus, and a fair youth having lovers, has no other trait of likeness to the Mino of Plato. The place of the Mino in the series is doubtfully indicated by internal evidence. The main character of the dialogue is Socrates, but to the general definitions of Socrates is added the Platonic doctrine of reminiscence. The problems of virtue and knowledge have been discussed in the Lyses, Lashes, Charmides, and Protagoras. The puzzle about knowing and learning has already appeared in the Euthydemus. The doctrines of immortality and pre-existence are carried further in the Phaedrus and Phaedo. The distinction between opinion and knowledge is more fully developed in Thetetus. The lessons of Prodicus, whom he facetiously calls his master, are still running in the mind of Socrates. Unlike the later Platonic dialogues, the Mino arrives at no conclusions. Hence we are led to place the dialogue at some point of time later than the Protagoras and earlier than the Phaedrus and Gorgias. The place which is assigned to it in this work is due mainly to the desire to bring together in a single volume all the dialogues which contain allusions to the trial and death of Socrates. End of Introduction Read for you by Chiquito Crasto, Birmingham, Alabama Section 2 of Mino by Plato. This is a LibriVox recording. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read for you by Chiquito Crasto. Mino by Plato. Translated by Benjamin Jowett. Section 2 On the Ideas of Plato. Plato's doctrine of ideas has attained an imaginary clearness and definiteness which is not to be found in his own writings. The popular account of them is partly derived from one or two passages in his dialogues interpreted without regard to their poetical environment. It is due also to the misunderstanding of him by the Aristotelian school and the erroneous notion has been further narrowed and has become fixed by the realism of the schoolman. This popular view of the Platonic ideas may be summed up in some such formula as the following. Truth consists not in particulars, but in universals, which have a place in the mind of God, or in some far-off heaven. These were revealed to men in a former state of existence, and are recovered by reminiscence, anamnesis, or association from sensible things. The sensible things are not realities, but shadows only, in relation to the truth. These unmeaning propositions are hardly suspected to be a caricature of a great theory of knowledge, which Plato in various ways and under many figures of speech is seeking to unfold. Poetry has been converted into dogma and it is not remarked that the Platonic ideas are to be found only in about a third of Plato's writings and are not confined to him. The forms which they assume are numerous, and if taken literally, inconsistent with one another. 
at one time we are in the clouds of mythology at another among the abstractions of mathematics or metaphysics we pass imperceptibly from one to the other reason and fancy are mingled in the same passage the ideas are sometimes described as many coextensive with the universals of sense and also with the first principles of ethics or again they are absorbed into the single idea of good and subordinated to it they are not more certain than facts but they are equally certain phaedo they are both personal and impersonal they are abstract terms they are also the causes of things and they are even transformed into the demons or spirits by whose help god made the world and the idea of good republic may without violence be converted into the supreme being who because he was good created all things timothy it would be a mistake to try and reconcile these differing modes of thought they are not to be regarded seriously as having a distinct meaning they are parables prophecies myths symbols revelations aspirations after an unknown world they derive their origin from a deep religious and contemplative feeling and also from an observation of curious mental phenomena they gather up the elements of the previous philosophies which they put together in a new form their great diversity shows the tentative character of early endeavors to think they have not yet settled down into a single system plato uses them though he also criticizes them he acknowledges that both he and others are always talking about them especially about the idea of good and they are not peculiar to himself phaedo republic sophocles but in his later writings he seems to have laid aside the old forms of them as he proceeds to make for himself new modes of expression more akin to the aristotelian logic yet amid all these varieties and incongruities there is a common meaning of spirit which pervades his writings both those in which he treats of the ideas and those in which he is silent about them this is the spirit of idealism which in the history of philosophy has had many names and taken many forms and has in a measure influenced those who seem to be most averse to it it has often been charged with inconsistency and fancifulness and yet has had an elevating effect on human nature and has exercised a wonderful charm and interest over a few spirits who have been lost in the thought of it it has been banished again and again but has always returned it has attempted to leave the earth and soar heavenwards but soon has found that only in experience could any solid foundation of knowledge be laid it has degenerated into pantheism but has again emerged no other knowledge has given an equal stimulus to the mind it is the science of sciences which are also ideas and under either aspect require to be defined they can only be thought of in due proportion when conceived in relation to one another they are the glasses through which the kingdoms of science are seen but at a distance all the greatest minds except when living in an age of reaction against them have unconsciously fallen under their power the account of the platonic ideas in the meno is the simplest and clearest and we shall best illustrate their nature by giving this first and then comparing the manner in which they are described elsewhere example in the phaedrus phaedo republic to which may be added the criticism of them in the parmenides the personal form which is attributed to them in the timaeus the logical character which they assume in the sophist and the philippus and the allusion to them in the laws in the cratylus they dawn upon him with the freshness of a newly discovered thought the meno goes back to a former state of existence in which men did and suffered good and evil and received the reward or punishment of them until their sin was purged away 
and they were allowed to return to earth. This is a tradition of the olden time, to which priests and poets bear witness. The souls of men returning to earth bring back a latent memory of ideas which were known to them in a former state. The recollection is awakened into life and consciousness by the sight of the things which resemble them on earth. The soul evidently possesses such innate ideas before she has had time to acquire them. This is proved by an experiment tried on one of Mino's slaves, from whom Socrates elicits truths of arithmetic and geometry which he has never learned in this world. He must therefore have brought them with him from another. The notion of a previous state of existence is found in the verse of Empedocles and in the fragments of Heraclitus. It was a natural answer to two questions. Whence came the soul? What is the origin of evil? And prevailed far and wide in the east. It found its way into Hellas, probably through the medium of Orphic and Pythagorean rites and mysteries. It was easier to think of a former than of a future life, because such a life has really existed for the race, though not for the individual, and all men come into the world, if not trailing clouds of glory, at any rate able to enter into the inheritance of the past. In the Phaedrus, as well as in the Mino, it is the former rather than a future life on which Plato is disposed to dwell. There the gods and men following in their train go forth to contemplate the heavens and are borne around in the revolutions of them. There they see the divine forms of justice, temperance, and the like, in their unchangeable beauty, but not without an effort more than human. The soul of man is likened to a charioteer and two steeds, one mortal, the other immortal. The charioteer and the mortal steed are in a fierce conflict. At length the animal principle is finally overpowered, though not extinguished by the combined energies of the passionate and rational elements. This is one of those passages in Plato which, partaking both of a philosophical and poetical character, is necessarily indistinct and inconsistent. The magnificent figure under which the nature of the soul is described has not much to do with the popular doctrine of the ideas. Yet, there is one little trait in the description which shows that they are present to Plato's mind, namely the remark that the soul, which has seen the truths in the form of the universal, cannot again return to the nature of an animal. In the Phaedo, as in the Mino, the origin of ideas is sought for in a previous state of existence. There was no time when they could have been acquired in this life, and therefore they must have been recovered from another. The process of recovery is no other than the ordinary law of association, by which in daily life the sight of one thing or person recalls another to our minds, and by which, in scientific enquiry, from any part of knowledge we may be led on to infer the whole. It is also argued that ideas, or rather ideals, must be derived from a previous state of existence, because they are more perfect than the sensible forms of them which are given by experience. But in the Phaedo, the doctrine of ideas is subordinate to the proof of the immortality of the soul. If the soul existed in a previous state, then it will exist in a future state, for a law of alternation pervades all things. And if the ideas exist, then the soul exists, if not, not. It is to be observed, both in the Mino and the Phaedo, that Socrates expresses himself with diffidence. He speaks in the Phaedo of the words with which he has comforted himself and his friends, and will not be too confident that the description which he has given of the soul and her mansions is exactly true. But he ventures to think that something of the kind is true, and in the Mino, after dwelling upon the immortality of the soul, he adds, of some things which I have said I am not altogether confident, compare Apology, Georgius. From this class of uncertainties he exempts the difference between truth and appearance, of which he is absolutely convinced. In the Republic, the ideas are spoken of in two ways, which, though not contradictory, are different. 
in the tenth book they are represented as the genera or general ideas under which individuals having a common name are contained for example there is the bed which the carpenter makes the picture of the bed which is drawn by the painter the bed existing in nature of which god is the author of the latter all visible beds are only the shadows or reflections this and similar illustrations or explanations are put forth not for their own sake or as an exposition of plato's theory of ideas but with a view of showing that poetry and the mimetic arts are concerned with an inferior part of the soul and a lower kind of knowledge on the other hand in the sixth and seventh books of the republic we reach the highest and most perfect conception which plato is able to attain of the nature of knowledge the ideas are now finally seen to be one as well as many causes as well as ideas and to have a unity which is the idea of good and the cause of all the rest they seem however to have lost their first aspect of universals under which individuals are contained and to have been converted into forms of another kind which are inconsistently regarded from the one side as images or ideals of justice temperance holiness and the like from the other are hypotheses or mathematical truths or principles in the timaeus which is the series of plato's works immediately follows the republic though probably written some time afterwards no mention occurs of the doctrine of ideas geometrical forms and arithmetical ratios furnish the laws according to which the world is created but though the conception of the ideas as genera or species is forgotten or laid aside the distinction of the visible and intellectual is as firmly maintained as ever the idea of good likewise disappears and is superseded by the conception of a personal god who works according to a final cause or principle of goodness which he himself is no doubt is expressed by plato either in the timaeus or in any other dialogue of the truths which he conceives to be the first and highest it is not the existence of god or the idea of good which he approaches in a tentative or hesitating manner but the investigations of physiology these he regards not seriously as a part of philosophy but as an innocent recreation timothy passing on to the parmenides we find in that dialogue not an exposition or defence of the doctrine of ideas but an assault upon them which is put into the mouth of the veteran parmenides and might be ascribed to aristotle himself or to one of his disciples the doctrine which is assailed takes two or three forms but fails in any of them to escape the dialectical difficulties which are urged against it it is admitted that there are ideas of all things but the manner in which individuals partake of them whether of the whole or of the part and in which they become like them or how ideas can be either within or without the sphere of human knowledge or how the human and divine can have any relation to each other is held to be incapable of explanation and yet if there are no universal ideas what becomes of philosophy parmenides in the sophist the theory of ideas is spoken of as a doctrine held not by plato but by another set of philosophers called the friends of ideas probably the megarians who are very distinct from him if not opposed to him sophist nor in what may be termed plato's abridgment of the history of philosophy sophocles is any mention made such as we find in the first book of aristotle's metaphysics of the derivation of such a theory or any part of it from the pythagoreans the eleatics the heracleteans or even from socrates in the philebus probably one of the latest of the platonic dialogues the conception of a personal or semi-personal deity expressed under the figure of mind the king of all who is also the cause is retained the one and many of the phaedrus and theatetus is still working in the mind of plato and the correlation of ideas not of all with all but of some with some is asserted and explained but they are spoken of in a different manner and are not supposed to be recovered from a former state of existence the metaphysical conception of truth passes into a psychological one which is continued in the laws 
and in the final form of the platonic philosophy so far as can be gathered from his own writings see especially laws in the laws he harps once more on the old string and returns to general notions these he acknowledges to be many and yet he insists that they are also one the guardian must be made to recognize the truth for which he has contended long ago in the protagoras that the virtues are four but they are also in the sense one laws compare protagoras so various and if regarded on the surface only inconsistent are the statements of plato respecting the doctrine of ideas if we attempt to harmonize or to combine them we should make out of them not a system but the caricature of a system they are the ever varying expression of plato's idealism the terms used in them are in their substance and general meaning the same although they seem to be different they pass from the subject to the object from the earth diocetes to heaven genseets without a regard to the gulf which later theology and philosophy have made between them they are also intended to supplement or explain each other they relate to a subject of which plato himself would have said he was not confident of the precise form of his own statements but was strong in the belief that something of the kind was true it is the spirit not the letter in which they agree the spirit which places the divine above the human the spiritual above the material the one above the many the mind before the body the stream of ancient philosophy in the alexandrian and roman times widens into a lake or sea and then disappears underground to reappear after many ages in a distant land it begins to flow again under new conditions at first confined between high and narrow banks but finally spreading over the continent of europe it is and is not the same with ancient philosophy there is a great deal in modern philosophy which is inspired by ancient there is much in ancient philosophy which was born out of due time and before men were capable of understanding it to the fathers of modern philosophy their own thoughts appeared to be new and original but they carried with them an echo or shadow of the past coming back by recollection from an elder world of this the inquirers of the seventeenth century who to themselves appeared to be working out independently the inquiry into all truth were unconscious they stood in a new relation to theology and natural philosophy and for a time maintained towards both an attitude of reserve and separation yet the similarities between the modern and ancient thought are greater far than the differences all philosophy even that part of it which is said to be based upon experience is really ideal and ideas are not only derived from facts but they are also prior to them and extend far beyond them just as the mind is prior to the senses early greek speculation culminates in the ideas of plato or rather in the single idea of good his followers and perhaps he himself having arrived at this elevation instead of going forwards went backwards from philosophy to psychology from ideas to numbers but what we perceive to be the real meaning of them an explanation of the nature and origin of knowledge will always continue to be one of the first problems of philosophy plato also left behind him a most potent instrument the forms of logic arms ready for use but not yet taken out of their armory they were the late birth of the early greek philosophy and were the only part of it which has had an uninterrupted hold on the mind of europe philosophies come and go but the detection of fallacies the framing of definitions the invention of methods still continue to be the main elements of the reasoning process modern philosophy like ancient begins with very simple conceptions it is almost wholly a reflection on self it might be described as a quickening into life of old words and notions latent in the semi-barbarous latin and putting a new meaning into them unlike ancient philosophy it has been unaffected by impressions derived from outward nature it arose within the limits of the mind itself from the time of descartes to hume and kant it has had little or nothing to do with facts of science on the other hand the ancient and medieval logic retained a continuous influence over it 
and a form like that of mathematics was easily impressed upon it the principle of ancient philosophy which is most apparent in it is skepticism we must doubt nearly every traditional or received notion that we may hold fast one or two the being of god in a personal or impersonal form was a mental necessity to the first thinkers of modern times from this alone all other ideas could be deduced there had been an obscure presentiment of cognito ergo sum more than two thousand years previously the eleatic notion that being and thought were the same was revived in a new form by descartes but now it gave birth to consciousness and self-reflection it awakened the ego in human nature the mind naked and abstract has no other certainty but the conviction of its own existence i think therefore i am and this thought is god thinking in me who has also communicated to the reason of man his own attributes of thought and extension these are truly imparted to him because god is true compare republic it has been often remarked that descartes having begun by dismissing all presuppositions introduces several he passes almost at once from skepticism to dogmatism it is more important for the illustration of plato to observe that he like plato insists that god is true and incapable of deception republic that he proceeds from general ideas that many elements of mathematics may be found in him a certain influence of mathematics both on the form and substance of their philosophy is discernible in both of them after making the greatest opposition between thought and extension descartes like plato supposes them to be reunited for a time not in their own nature but by a special divine act compare phaedrus and he also supposes all parts of the human modern philosophy as having begun like the pre-socratics with a few general notions descartes first falls absolutely under their influence and then quickly discards them at the same time he is less able to observe facts because they are too much magnified by the glasses through which they are seen the common logic says the greater the extension the less the comprehension and we may put the same thought in another way and say of abstract or general ideas that the greater the abstraction of them the less they are capable of being applied to particular and concrete natures not very different from descartes in his relation to ancient philosophy is his successor spinoza who lived in the following generation the system of spinoza is less personal and also less dualistic than that of descartes in this respect the difference between them is like that between xenophanes and parmenides the teaching of spinoza might be described generally as the jewish religion reduced to an abstraction and taking the form of the eleatic philosophy like parmenides he is overpowered and intoxicated with the idea of being or god the greatness of both philosophies consists in the immensity of a thought which includes all other thoughts their weakness is the necessary separation of this thought from actual existence and from practical life in neither of them is there any clear opposition between the inward and outward world the substance of spinoza has two attributes which alone are cognizable by man thought and extension these are in extreme opposition to one another and also in inseparable identity they may be regarded as the two aspects or expressions under which god or substance is unfolded to man here a step is made beyond the limits of the eleatic philosophy the famous theorem of spinoza omnis determinatio et negatio is already contained in the negation is relation of plato's sophist the grand description of the philosopher in republic six as a spectator of all time and all existence may be paralleled with another famous expression of spinoza contemplatio rerum sub specie eternitatis according to spinoza finite objects are unreal for they are conditioned by what is alien to them and by one another human beings are included in the number of them hence there is no reality in human action and no place for right and wrong individuality is accident the boasted freedom of the will is only a consciousness of necessity truth he says is the direction of the reason towards the infinite in which all things repose 
and herein lies the secret of man's well-being in the exaltation of the reason or intellect in the denial of the voluntariness of evil timaeus laws spinoza approaches nearer to plato than in his conception of an infinite substance as socrates said that virtue is knowledge so spinoza would have maintained that knowledge alone is good and what contributes to knowledge useful both are equally far from any real experience or observation of nature and the same difficulty is found in both when we seek to apply their ideas to life and practice there is a gulf fixed between the infinite substance and finite objects or individuals of spinoza just as there is between the ideas of plato and the world of sense removed from spinoza by less than a generation is the philosopher leibniz who after deepening and intensifying the opposition between mind and matter reunites them by his preconcerted harmony compare again phaedrus to him all the particles of matter are living beings which reflect on one another and in the least of them the whole is contained here we catch a reminiscence both of the omeomeri or similar particles of anaxagoras and of the world animal of the timaeus in bacon and locke we have another development in which the mind of man is supposed to receive knowledge by a new method and to work by observation and experience but we may remark that it is the idea of experience rather than experience itself with which the mind is filled it is a symbol of knowledge rather than the reality which is vouchsafed to us the organon of bacon is not much nearer to actual facts than the organon of aristotle or the platonic idea of good many of the old rags and ribbons which deface the garment of philosophy have been stripped off but some of them still appear. a crude conception of the ideas of plato survives in the forms of bacon and on the other hand there are many passages of plato in which the importance of the investigation of facts is as much insisted upon as by bacon both are almost equally superior to the illusions of language and are constantly crying out against them as against other idols locke cannot be truly regarded as the author of sensationalism any more than of idealism his system is based upon experience but with him experience includes reflection as well as sense his analysis and construction of ideas has no foundation in fact it is only the dialectic of the mind talking to herself the philosophy of berkeley is but the transposition of two words for objects of sense he would substitute sensations he imagines himself to have changed the relation of the human mind towards god and nature they remain the same as before though he has drawn the imaginary line by which they are divided at a different point he has annihilated the outward world but it instantly reappears governed by the same laws and described under the same names a like remark applies to david hume of whose philosophy the central principle is the denial of the relation of cause and effect he would deprive men of a familiar term which they can ill afford to lose but he seems not to have observed that this alteration is merely verbal and does not in any degree affect the nature of things still less did he remark that he was arguing from the necessary imperfection of language against most certain facts and here again we may find a parallel with the ancients he goes beyond facts in the scepticism as they did in their idealism like the ancient sophists he relegates the more important principles of ethics to custom and probability but crude and unmeaning as this philosophy is it exercised a great influence on his successors not unlike that which locke exercised upon berkeley and berkeley upon hume himself all three were both sceptical and ideal in almost equal degrees neither they nor did their predecessors had any true conception of language or of the history of philosophy hume's paradox has been forgotten by the world and did not any more than the scepticism of the ancients require to be seriously refuted like some other philosophical paradoxes it would have been better left to die out it certainly could not be refuted by a philosophy such as kant's in which no less than in the previously mentioned systems the history of the human mind and the nature of language are almost wholly ignored and the certainty of objective knowledge is transferred to the subject while absolute truth is reduced to a figment more abstract and narrow 
than plato's ideas of thing in itself to which if we reason strictly no predicate can be applied the question which plato has raised respecting the origin and nature of ideas belongs to the infancy of philosophy in modern times it would no longer be asked their origin is only their history so far as we know it there can be no other we may trace them in language in philosophy in mythology in poetry but we cannot argue a priori about them we may attempt to shake them off but they are always returning and in every sphere of science and human action are tending to go beyond facts they are thought to be innate because they have been familiar to us all our lives and we can no longer dismiss them from our mind many of them express relations of terms to which nothing exactly or nothing at all in rerum natura corresponds we are not such free agents in the use of them as we sometimes imagine fixed ideas have taken the most complete possession of some thinkers who have been most determined to renounce them and have been vehemently affirmed when they could least be explained and were incapable of proof the world has often been led away by a word to which no distinct meaning could be attached abstractions such as authority equality utility liberty pleasure experience consciousness chance substance matter atom and a heap of other metaphysical and theological terms are the source of quite as much error and illusion and have as little relation to actual facts as the ideas of plato few students of theology or philosophy have sufficiently reflected how quickly the bloom of a philosophy passes away or how hard it is for one age to understand the writings of another or how nice a judgment is required of those who are seeking to express the philosophy of one age in terms of another the eternal truths of which metaphysicians speak have hardly ever lasted more than a generation in our own day schools or systems of philosophy which have once been famous have died before the founders of them we are still as in plato's age groping about for a new method more comprehensive than any of those which now prevail and also more permanent and we seem to see at a distance the promise of such a method which can hardly be any other than the method of idealized experience having roots which strike far down into the history of philosophy it is a method which does not divorce the present from the past or the part from the whole or the abstract from the concrete or theory from fact or the divine from the human or one science from another but labors to connect them along such a road we have proceeded a few steps sufficient perhaps to make us reflect on the want of method which prevails in our own day in another age all the branches of knowledge whether relating to god or man or nature will become the knowledge of the revelation of a single science and all things like stars in heaven will shed their light upon one another end of section 2 on the ideas of plato Read for you by Chiquito Crasto, Birmingham, Alabama. Part One of the Dialogues of Mino by Plato, translated by Benjamin Jowett. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read for you by Chiquito Crasto. Part One of the Dialogues of Mino. Mino. Persons of the Dialogue. Mino, Socrates, a slave of Mino, boy, Anytus. Mino, can you tell me, Socrates, whether virtue is acquired by teaching or by practice, or if neither by teaching nor by practice, then whether it comes to man by nature or in what other way? Socrates. O oh, Mino, there was a time when the Thessalians were famous among the other Hellenes only for their riches and their riding. But now, if I am not mistaken, they are equally famous for their wisdom, especially at Larissa, which is the native city of your friend Aristippus. And this is Gorgias's doing, for when he came there, the flower of the Aleudae, among them your admirer Aristippus and the other chiefs of the Thessalians fell in love with his wisdom. 
and he has taught you the habit of answering questions in a grand and bold style which becomes those who know and is the style in which he himself answers all comers and any helene who likes may ask him anything how different is our lot my dear mino here at athens there is a dearth of the commodity and all wisdom seems to have emigrated from us to you i am certain that if you were to ask any athenian whether virtue was natural or acquired he would laugh in your face and say stranger you have far too good an opinion of me if you think that i can answer your question for i literally do not know what virtue is and much less whether it is acquired by teaching or not and i myself may know living as i do in this region of poverty as am poor as the rest of the world and i confess with shame that i know literally nothing about virtue and when i do not know the quid of anything how can i know the quail how if i knew nothing at all of mino could i tell if he was fair or the opposite of fair rich and noble or the reverse of rich and noble do you think that i could mino no indeed but are you in earnest socrates in saying that you do not know what virtue is and am i to carry back this report of you to thessaly socrates not only that my dear boy but you may say further that i have never known of any one else who did in my judgment meno then you have never met gorgias when he was at athens socrates yes i have meno and did you not think that he knew socrates i have not a good memory meno and therefore i cannot tell what i thought of him at the time and i dare say that he did know and that you know what he said please therefore to remind me of what he said or if you would rather tell me your own view for i suspect that you and he think much alike meno very true socrates then as he is not here never mind him and do you tell me by the gods meno be generous and tell me what you say that virtue is for i shall be truly delighted to find that i have been mistaken and that you and gorgias do really have this knowledge although i have been just saying that i have never found anybody who had meno there will be no difficulty socrates in answering your question let us take first the virtue of a man he should know how to administer the state and in the administration of it to benefit his friends and harm his enemies and he must also be careful not to suffer harm himself a woman's virtue if you wish to know about that may also be easily described her duty is to order her house and keep what is indoors and obey her husband every age every condition of life young or old male or female bond or free has a different virtue there are virtues numberless and no lack of definitions of them for virtue is relative to the actions and ages of each of us in all that we do and that the same may be said of vice socrates compare aristotle's paul socrates how fortunate i am meno when i ask you for one virtue you present me with a swarm of them compare theat which are in your keeping suppose that i carry on the figure of the swarm and ask of you what is the nature of the bee and you answer that there are many kinds of bees and i reply but do bees differ as bees because there are many and different kinds of them or are they not rather to be distinguished by some other quality as for example beauty size or shape how would you answer me meno i should answer that bees do not differ from one another as bees socrates and if i went on to say that is what i desire to know meno tell me what is the quality in which they do not differ but are all alike would you be able to answer meno i should socrates and so of the virtues however many and different they may be they have all a common nature which makes them virtues and on this he who would answer the question what is virtue would do well to have his eye fixed do you understand meno i am beginning to understand 
but I do not as yet take hold of the question as I could wish. Socrates, when you say, Mino, that there is one virtue of a man, another of a woman, another of a child, and so on, does this apply only to virtue, or would you say the same of health and size and strength? Or is the nature of health always the same, whether in man or woman? Mino, I should say that health is the same, both in man and woman. Socrates, and is not this true of size and strength? If a woman is strong, she will be strong by reason of the same form and of the same strength, subsisting in her which there is in the man. I mean to say that strength as strength, whether of man or woman, is the same. Is there any difference? Meno. I think not. Socrates. And will not virtue as virtue be the same, whether in a child or in a grown-up person, in a woman or in a man? Meno. I cannot help feeling, Socrates, that this case is different from the others. Socrates. But why? Were you not saying that the virtue of a man was to order a state, and the virtue of a woman was to order a house? Meno. I did say so. Socrates. And can either house or state or anything be well ordered without temperance and without justice? Meno. Certainly not. Socrates. Then they who order a state or a house temperately, or justly, order them with temperance and justice? Meno. Certainly. Socrates. Then both men and women, if they are to be good men and women, must have the same virtues of temperance and justice? Meno. True. Socrates. And can either a young man or an elder one be good, if they are intemperate and unjust? Meno. They cannot. Socrates. They must be temperate and just? Meno. Yes. Socrates. Then all men are good in the same way, and by participation in the same virtues? Meno. Such is the inference. Socrates. And they surely would not have been good in the same way, unless their virtue had been the same? Meno. They would not. Socrates. Then now that the sameness of all virtue has been proven, Try and remember what you and Gorgias say that virtue is. Meno. Will you have one definition of them all? Socrates. That is what I am seeking. Meno. If you want to have one definition of them all, I know not what to say, but that virtue is the power of governing mankind. Socrates. And does this definition of virtue include all virtue? Is virtue the same in a child and in a slave, Meno? Can the child govern his father, or the slave his master? And would he who governed be any longer a slave? Meno. I think not, Socrates. Socrates. No, indeed. There would be small reason in that. Yet, once more, fair friend, according to you, virtue is the power of governing. But do you not add justly and not unjustly? Meno. Yes, Socrates, I agree there, for justice is virtue. Socrates. Would you say virtue, Meno, or a virtue? Meno. What do you mean? Socrates. I mean as I might say about anything, that a round, for example, is a figure and not simply figure, and I should adopt this mode of speaking, because there are other figures. Mino, quite right, and that is just what I am saying about virtue, that there are other virtues as well as justice. Socrates, what are they? Tell me the names of them, as I would tell you the names of other figures if you asked me. Mino, courage and temperance and wisdom and magnanimity are virtues, and there are many others. Socrates, yes, Mino, and again we are in the same case. In searching after one virtue, we have found many though not in the same way as before. But we have been unable to find the common virtue which runs through them all. Meno. Why, Socrates, even now I am not able to follow you in the attempt to get at one common notion of virtue as of other things. Socrates. No wonder. But I will try to get nearer if I can. For you know that all things have a common notion. Suppose now that someone asked you the question which I asked before. Mino, he would say, what is figure? 
and if you answered roundness, he would reply to you, in my way of speaking, by asking whether you would say that roundness is figure or a figure, and you would answer a figure. Meno. Certainly. Socrates. And for this reason, that there are other figures? Meno. Yes. Socrates. And if he proceeded to ask, what other figures are there, you would have told him? Meno. I should. Socrates. And if he similarly asked what color is, and you answered whiteness, and the questioner rejoined, would you say that whiteness is color or a color? You would reply a color, because there are other colors as well. Meno. I should. Socrates. And if he had said, tell me what they are, you would have told him of other colors, which are colors, just as much as whiteness. Meno. Yes. Socrates. And suppose that he were to pursue the matter in my way, he would say, Ever and anon we are landed in particulars, but this is not what I want. Tell me then, since you call them by a common name, and say that they are all figures, even when opposed to one another, what is that common nature which you designate as figure, which contains straight as well as round, and is no more one than the other? That would be your mode of speaking? Meno, yes. Socrates, and in speaking thus, you do not mean to say that round is round any more than straight, or the straight any more straight than round? Meno, certainly not. Socrates, you only assert that the round figure is not more a figure than the straight, or the straight than the round? Meno, very true. Socrates, to what then do we give the name of figure? Try and answer. Suppose that, when a person asked you this question, either about figure or color, you were to reply, Man, I do not understand what you want, or know what you are saying. He would look rather astonished, and say, Do you not understand that I am looking for the simile in multis? And then he might put the question in another form. Mino, he might say, What is that simile in multis which you call figure, and which includes not only round and straight figures, but all? Could you not answer that question, Mino? I wish that you would try. The attempt will be good practice with a view to the answer about virtue. Mino. I would rather that you should answer, Socrates. Socrates. Shall I indulge you? Mino. By all means. Socrates. And then you will tell me about virtue. Mino. I will. Socrates. Then I must do my best, for there is a prize to be won. Mino. Certainly. Socrates. Well, I will try and explain to you what figure is. What do you say to this answer? Figure is the only thing which always follows colors. Will you be satisfied with it, as I am sure that I should be, if you would let me have a similar definition of virtue? Mino. But Socrates, it is such a simple answer. Socrates. Why simple? Mino. Because, according to you, Figure is that which always follows color. Socrates, granted. Mino, but if a person were to say that he does not know what color is any more than what figure is, what sort of answer would you have given him? Socrates, I should have told him the truth, and if he were a philosopher of the eristic and antagonistic sort, I should say to him, you have my answer, and if I am wrong, your business is to take up the argument and refute me. But if we were friends and were talking as you and I are now, I should reply in a milder strain and more in the dialectician's vein, that is to say, I should not only speak the truth, but I should make use of premises which the person interrogated would be willing to admit. And this is the way in which I shall endeavor to approach you. You will acknowledge, will you not, that there is such a thing as an end, or termination, or extremity, all which words are used in the same sense, although I am aware that Prodicus might draw distinctions about them. But still you, I am sure, would speak of a thing as ended or terminated. That is all which I am saying, not anything very difficult. Mino. Yes, I should, and I believe that I understand your meaning. Mino. Yes. Socrates. And you would speak of a surface and also of a solid, as, for example, in geometry. Mino. Yes. Socrates. Well, then, you are now in a condition to understand my definition of figure. I define figure to be that in which the solid ends, or more concisely, the limit of solid. Mino. 
and now socrates what is color socrates you are outrageous meno in thus plaguing a poor old man to give you an answer when you will not take the trouble of remembering what is gorgias's definition of virtue meno when you have told me what i ask i will tell you socrates socrates a man who was blindfolded has only to hear you talking and he would know that you are a fair creature and have still many lovers meno why do you think so socrates why because you always speak in imperatives like all beauties when they are in their prime you are tyrannical and also as i suspect you have found out that i have weakness for the fair and therefore to humour you i must answer meno please do socrates would you like me to answer you after the manner of gorgias which is familiar to you meno i should like nothing better socrates do not he and you and empedocles say that there are certain effluences of existence meno certainly socrates and passages into which and through which the effluences pass meno exactly socrates and some of the effluences fit into the passages and some of them are too small or too large meno true socrates and there is such a thing as sight meno yes socrates and now as pindar says read my meaning color is an effluence of form commensurate with sight and palpable to sense meno that socrates appears to me to be an admirable answer socrates why yes because it happens to be one which you have been in the habit of hearing and your wit will have discovered i suspect that you may explain in the same way the nature of sound and smell and of many other similar phenomena meno quite true socrates the answer meno was in the orthodox solemn vein and therefore was more acceptable to you than the other answer about figure meno yes socrates and yet o son of alexidemus i cannot help thinking that the other was the better and i am sure that you would be of the same opinion if you would only stay and be initiated and were not compelled as you said yesterday to go away before the mysteries meno but i will stay socrates if you will give me many such answers socrates well then for my own sake as well as for yours i will do my best but i am afraid i shall not be able to give you very many as good and now in your turn you are to fulfil your promise and tell me what virtue is in the universal and do not make a singular into a plural as the facetious say of those who break a thing but deliver virtue to me whole and sound and not broken into a number of pieces i have given you the pattern meno well then socrates virtue as i take it is when he who desires the honourable is able to provide it for himself so the poet says and i say too virtue is the desire of things honourable and the power of attaining them socrates and does he who desires the honourable also desire the good meno certainly socrates then there are some who desire the evil and others who desire the good do not all men my dear sir desire good meno i think not socrates there are some who desire evil meno yes socrates do you mean that they think the evils which they desire to be good or do they know that they are evil and yet desire them meno both i think socrates and do you really imagine meno that a man knows evils to be evils and desires them notwithstanding meno certainly i do socrates and desire is of possession meno yes of possession socrates and does he think that the evils will do good to him who possess them or does he know that they will do him harm meno there are some who think that the evils will do them good and others who know that they will do them harm socrates and in your opinion do those who think that they will do them good know that they are evils meno certainly not socrates is it not obvious that those who are ignorant of their nature do not desire them but they desire what they suppose to be goods although they are really evils and if they are mistaken and suppose the evils to be goods they really desire goods meno yes in that case socrates well 
and do those who as you say desire evils and think that evils are hurtful to the possessor of them know that they will be hurt by them meno they must know it socrates and must they not suppose that those who are hurt are miserable in proportion to the hurt which is inflicted upon them meno how can it be otherwise socrates but are not the miserable ill-fated meno yes indeed socrates and does any one desire to be miserable and ill-fated meno i should say not socrates socrates but if there is no one who desires to be miserable there is no one meno who desires evil for what is misery but the desire and possession of evil meno that appears to be the truth socrates and i admit that nobody desires evil socrates and yet were you not saying just now that virtue is the desire and power of attaining good meno yes i did say so socrates but if this be affirmed then the desire of good is common to all and one man is no better than another in that respect meno true socrates and if one man is not better than another in desiring good he must be better in the power of attaining it meno exactly socrates then according to your definition virtue would appear to be the power of attaining good meno i entirely approve socrates of the manner in which you now view this matter socrates then let us see whether what you say is true from another point of view for very likely you may be right you affirm virtue to be the power of attaining goods meno yes socrates and the goods which you mean are such as health and wealth and the possession of gold and silver and having office and honour in the state those are what you would call goods meno yes i should include all those socrates then according to meno who is the hereditary friend of the great king virtue is the power of getting silver and gold and would you add that they must be attained piously justly or do you deem this to be of no consequence and is any mode of acquisition even if unjust and dishonest equally to be deemed virtue meno not virtue socrates but vice socrates then justice or temperance or holiness or some other part of virtue as would appear must accompany the acquisition and without them the mere acquisition of good will not be virtue meno why how can there be virtue without these socrates and the non-acquisition of gold and silver in a dishonest manner for oneself or another or in other words the want of them may be equally virtue meno true socrates then the acquisition of such goods is no more virtue than the non-acquisition and want of them but whatever is accompanied by justice or honesty is virtue and whatever is devoid of justice is vice meno it cannot be otherwise in my judgment socrates and were we not saying just now that justice temperance and the like were each of them a part of virtue meno yes socrates and so meno this is the way in which you mock me meno why do you say that socrates socrates why because i asked you to deliver virtue into my hands whole and unbroken and i gave you a pattern according to which you were to frame your answer and you have forgotten already and tell me that virtue is the power of attaining good justly or with justice and justice you acknowledge to be a part of virtue meno yes socrates then it follows from your own admissions that virtue is doing what you do with a part of virtue for justice and the like are said by you to be parts of virtue meno what of that socrates what of that why did not i ask you to tell me the nature of virtue as a whole and you are very far from telling me this but declare every action to be virtue which is done with a part of virtue as though you had told me that i must already know the whole of virtue and this too when frittered away into little pieces and therefore my dear meno i fear that i must begin again and repeat the same question what is virtue for otherwise i can only say that every action done with a part of virtue is virtue what else is the meaning of saying that every action done with justice is virtue ought i not to ask the question over again for can any one who does not know virtue know a part of virtue meno 
no i do not say that he can socrates do you remember how in the example of figure we rejected any answer given in terms which were as yet unexplained or unadmitted meno yes socrates and we were quite right in doing so socrates but then my friend do not suppose that we can explain to any one the nature of virtue as a whole through some unexplained portion of virtue or anything at all in that fashion we should only have to ask over again the old question what is virtue am i not right meno i believe that you are socrates then begin again and answer me what according to you and your friend gorgias is the definition of virtue meno o oh, socrates i used to be told before i knew you that you were always doubting yourself and making others doubt and now you are casting your spells over me and i am simply getting bewitched and enchanted and am at my wit's end and if i may venture to make a jest upon you you seem to me both in your appearance and in your power over others to be very like the flat torpedo fish who torpifies those who come near him and touch him as you have now torpified me i think for my soul and my tongue are really torpid and i do not know how to answer you and though i have been delivered of an infinite variety of speeches about virtue before now and to many persons and very good ones they were as i thought at this moment i cannot even say what virtue is and i think that you are very wise in not voyaging and going away from home for if you did in other places as you do in athens you would be cast into prison as a magician socrates you are a rogue meno and had all but caught me meno what do you mean socrates socrates i can tell why you made a simile about me meno why socrates in order that i might make another simile about you for i know that all pretty young gentlemen like to have pretty similes made about them as well they may but i shall not return the compliment as to my being a torpedo if the torpedo is torpid as well as the cause of torpidity in others then indeed i am a torpedo but not otherwise for i perplex others not because i am clear but because i am utterly perplexed myself and now i know not what virtue is and you seem to be in the same case although you did once perhaps know before you touched me however i have no objection to join with you in the enquiry meno and how will you enquire socrates into that which you do not know what will you put forth as a subject of enquiry and if you find what you want how will you ever know that this is a thing which you did not know socrates i know meno what you mean but just see what a tiresome dispute you are introducing you argue that a man cannot enquire either about that which he knows or about that which he does not know for if he knows he has no need to enquire and if not he cannot for he does not know the very subject about which he is to enquire compare aristotle post anal meno well socrates and is not the argument sound socrates i think not meno why not socrates i will tell you why i have heard from certain wise men and women who spoke of things divine that meno what did they say socrates they spoke of a glorious truth as i conceive meno what was it and who were they socrates some of them were priests and priestesses who had studied how they might be able to give a reason of their profession there have been poets also who spoke of these things by inspiration like pindar and many others who were inspired and they say mark now and see whether their words are true they say that the soul of man is immortal and at one time has an end which is termed dying and at another time is born again but is never destroyed and the moral is that a man ought to live always in perfect holiness for in the ninth year persephone sends the souls of those from whom she has received the penalty of ancient crime back again from beneath into the light of the sun above and these are they who become noble kings and mighty men and great in wisdom and are called saintly heroes in after ages the soul then as being immortal and having been born again many times 
and having seen all things that exist whether in this world or in the world below has knowledge of them all and it is no wonder that she should be able to call to remembrance all that she ever knew about virtue and about everything for as all nature is akin and the soul has learned all things there is no difficulty in her eliciting or as men say learning out of a single recollection all the rest if a man is strenuous and does not faint for all enquiry and all learning is but recollection and therefore we ought not to listen to this sophistical argument about the impossibility of enquiry for it will make us idle and is sweet only to the sluggard but the other saying will make us active and inquisitive in that confiding i will gladly enquire with you into the nature of virtue meno yes socrates but what do you mean by saying that we do not learn and that what we call learning is only a process of recollection can you teach me how this is socrates i told you meno just now that you were a rogue and now you ask whether i can teach you when i am saying that there is no teaching but only recollection and thus you imagine that you will involve me in a contradiction meno indeed socrates i protest that i had no such intention i only ask the question from habit but if you can prove to me that what you say is true i wish that you would socrates it will be no easy matter but i will try to please you to the utmost of my power suppose that you call one of your numerous attendants that i may demonstrate on him meno certainly come hither boy socrates he is greek and speaks greek does he not meno yes indeed he was born in the house socrates attend now to the questions which i ask him and observe whether he learns of me or only remembers meno i will socrates tell me boy do you know what a figure like this is a square boy i do socrates and you know what a square figure has these four lines equal boy certainly socrates and these lines which i have drawn through the middle of the square are also equal boy yes socrates a square may be of any size boy certainly socrates and if one side of the figure be of two feet and the other side be of two feet how much will the whole be let me explain if in one direction the space was of two feet and in the other direction of one foot the whole would be of two feet taken once boy yes socrates but since this side is also of two feet there are twice two feet boy there are socrates then the square is of twice two feet boy yes socrates and how many are twice two feet count and tell me boy four socrates socrates and might there not be another square twice as large as this and having like this the lines equal boy yes socrates and of how many feet will that be boy of eight feet socrates and now try and tell me the length of the line which forms the side of that double square this is two feet what will that be boy clearly socrates it'll be double socrates do you observe meno that i am not teaching the boy anything but only asking him questions and now he fancies that he knows how long a line is necessary in order to produce a figure of eight square feet does he not meno yes socrates and does he really know meno certainly not socrates he only guesses that because the square is double the line is double meno true socrates observe him while he recalls the steps in regular order to the boy tell me boy do you assert that a double space comes from a double line remember that i am not speaking of an oblong but of a figure equal every way and twice the size of this that is to say of eight feet and i want to know whether you will say that a double square comes from double line boy yes socrates but does not this line become doubled if we add another such line here boy certainly socrates and four such lines will make a space containing eight feet boy yes socrates let us describe such a figure would you not say that this is a figure of eight feet boy yes socrates and are there not these four divisions in the figure 
each of which is equal to the figure of four feet boy true socrates and is not that four times four boy certainly and four times is not double boy no indeed socrates but how much boy four times as much socrates therefore the double line boy has given a space not twice but four times as much boy true socrates four times four are sixteen are they not boy yes socrates what line would give you a space of eight feet as this gives one of sixteen feet do you see boy yes socrates and the space of four feet is made from this half line boy yes socrates good and is not a space of eight feet twice the size of this and half the size of the other boy certainly socrates such a space then will be made out of a line greater than this one and less than that one boy yes i think so socrates very good i like to hear you say what you think and now tell me is not this a line of two feet and that of four boy yes socrates then the line which forms the side of eight feet ought to be more than this line of two feet and less than the other of four feet boy it ought socrates try and see if you can tell me how much it will be boy three feet socrates then if we add a half to this line of two that will be the line of three here are two and there is one and on the other side here are two also and there is one and that makes the figure of which you speak boy yes socrates but if there are three feet this way and three feet that way the whole space will be three times three feet boy that is evident socrates and how much are three times three feet boy nine socrates and how much is the double of four boy eight socrates then the figure of eight is not made out of a line of three boy no socrates but from what line tell me exactly and if you would rather not reckon try and show me the line boy indeed socrates i do not know socrates do you see meno what advances he has made in his power of recollection he did not know at first and he does not know now what is the side of a figure of eight feet but then he thought that he knew and answered confidently as if he knew and had no difficulty now he has a difficulty and neither knows nor fancies that he knows meno true socrates is he not better off in knowing his ignorance meno i think that he is socrates if we have made him doubt and given him the torpedo shock have we done him any harm meno i think not socrates we have certainly as would seem assisted him in some degree to the discovery of the truth and now he will wish to remedy his ignorance but then he would have been ready to tell all the world again and again that the double space should have a double side meno true socrates but do you suppose that he would ever have inquired into or learned what he fancied that he knew though he was really ignorant of it until he had fallen into perplexity under the idea that he did not know and had desired to know meno i think not socrates socrates then he was the better for the torpedo's touch meno i think so socrates mark now the father development i shall only ask him and not teach him and he shall share the enquiry with me and do you watch and see if you find me telling or explaining anything to him instead of eliciting his opinion tell me boy is not this a square of four feet which i have drawn boy yes socrates and now i add another square equal to the former one boy yes socrates and a third which is equal to either of them boy yes socrates suppose that we fill up the vacant corner boy very good socrates here then there are four equal spaces boy yes socrates and how many times larger is this space than the other boy four times socrates but it ought to have been twice only as you will remember boy true socrates 
and does not this line reaching from corner to corner bisect each of these spaces boy yes and are there not here four equal lines which contain this space boy there are socrates look and see how much the space is boy i do not understand socrates has not each interior line cut off half of the four spaces boy yes socrates and how many spaces are there in this section boy four socrates and how many in this boy two socrates and four is how many times two boy twice socrates and this space is of how many feet boy of eight feet socrates and from what line do you get this figure boy from this socrates that is from the line which extends from corner to corner of the figure of four feet boy yes socrates and that is the line which the learned call the diagonal and if this is the proper name then you meno's slave are prepared to affirm that the double space is the square of the diagonal boy certainly socrates socrates what do you say of him meno were not all these answers given out of his own head meno yes they were all his own socrates and yet as we were just now saying he did not know meno true socrates but still he had in him those notions of his had he not meno yes socrates then he who does not know may still have true notions of that which he does not know meno he has socrates and at present these notions have just been stirred up in him as in a dream but if he were frequently asked the same questions in different forms he would know as well as any one at last meno i dare say socrates without any one teaching him he will recover his knowledge for himself if he is only asked questions meno yes socrates and this spontaneous recovery of knowledge in him is recollection meno true socrates and this knowledge which he now has must he not either have acquired or always possessed meno yes socrates but if he always possessed this knowledge he would always have known or if he has acquired the knowledge he could not have acquired it in this life unless he has been taught geometry end of part one of the dialogues of meno read for you by chiquito crasto birmingham alabama Part two of the Dialogues of Meno by Plato Translated by Benjamin Jowett. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read for you by Chiquito Crasto. For he may be made to do the same with all geometry and every other branch of knowledge. Now, has any one ever taught him all this? You must know about him, if as you say he was born and bred in your house, Meno and i am certain that no one ever did teach him socrates and yet he has the knowledge meno the fact socrates is undeniable socrates but if he did not acquire the knowledge in this life then he must have had and learned it at some other time meno clearly he must socrates which must have been the time when he was not a man meno yes socrates and if there have been always true thoughts in him both at the time when he was and was not a man which only need to be awakened into knowledge by putting questions to him his soul must have always possessed this knowledge for he always either was or was not a man meno obviously socrates and if the truth of all things always existed in the soul then the soul is immortal wherefore be of good cheer and try to recollect what you do not know or rather what you do not remember meno i feel somehow that i like what you are saying socrates and i meno like what i am saying some things i have said of which i am not altogether confident but that we shall be better and braver and less helpless if we think that we ought to enquire that we should have been if we indulged in the idle fancy that there was no knowing and no use in seeking to know what we do not know that is a theme upon which i am ready to fight in word and deed to the utmost of my power meno 
There again, Socrates, your words seem to me excellent. Socrates, then, as we are agreed that a man should enquire about that which he does not know, shall you and I make an effort to enquire together into the nature of virtue? Meno, by all means, Socrates, and yet I would much rather return to my original question, whether in seeking to acquire virtue we should regard it as a thing to be taught or as a gift of nature or as coming to men in some other way socrates had i the command of you as well as of myself meno i would not have inquired whether virtue is given by instruction or not until we had first ascertained what it is but as you think only of controlling me who am your slave and never of controlling yourself such being your notion of freedom i must yield to you for you are irresistible and therefore i have now to enquire into the qualities of a thing of which i do not as yet know the nature at any rate will you condescend a little and allow the question whether virtue is given by instruction or in any other way to be argued upon hypothesis as the geometrician when he is asked whether a certain triangle is capable being inscribed in a certain circle or whether a certain area is capable of being inscribed as a triangle in a certain circle will reply i cannot tell you as yet but i will offer a hypothesis which may assist us in forming a conclusion if the figure be such that when you have produced a given side of it or when you apply it to the given line that is the diameter of the circle auto the given area of the triangle falls short by an area corresponding to the part produced or similar to the area so applied then one consequence follows and if this is impossible then some other and therefore i wish to assume a hypothesis before i tell you whether this triangle is capable of being inscribed in the circle that is a geometrical hypothesis and we too as we know not the nature and qualities of virtue must ask whether virtue is or is not taught under a hypothesis as thus if virtue is of such a class of mental goods will it be taught or not let the first hypothesis be that virtue is or is not knowledge in that case will it be taught or not or as we were just now saying remembered for there is no use in disputing about the name but is virtue taught or not or rather does not every one see that knowledge alone is taught meno i agree socrates then if virtue is knowledge virtue will be taught meno certainly socrates then now we have made a quick end of this question if virtue is of such a nature will it be taught and if not not meno certainly socrates the next question is whether virtue is knowledge or of another species meno yes that appears to be the question which comes next in order socrates do we not say that virtue is a good this is a hypothesis which is not set aside meno certainly socrates now if there be any sort of good which is distinct from knowledge virtue may be that good but if knowledge embraces all good then we shall be right in thinking that virtue is knowledge meno true socrates and virtue makes us good meno yes socrates and if we are good then we are profitable for all good things are profitable meno yes socrates then virtue is profitable meno that is the only inference socrates then now let us see what are the things which severally profit us health and strength and beauty and wealth these and the like of these we call profitable meno true socrates and yet these things may also sometimes do us harm would you not think so meno yes socrates and what is the guiding principle which makes them profitable or the reverse are they not profitable when they are rightly used and hurtful when they are not rightly used meno certainly socrates next let us consider the goods of the soul they are temperance justice courage quickness of apprehension memory magnanimity and the like meno surely socrates and such of these as are not knowledge but of another sort are sometimes profitable and sometimes hurtful as for example courage wanting prudence which is only a sort of confidence when a man has no sense he is harmed by courage but when he has sense he is profited meno true socrates 
and the same may be said of temperance and quickness of apprehension whatever things are learned or done with sense are profitable but when done without sense they are hurtful meno very true socrates and in general all that the soul attempts or endures when under the guidance of wisdom ends in happiness but when she is under the guidance of folly in the opposite meno that appears to be true socrates if then virtue is a quality of the soul and is admitted to be profitable it must be wisdom or prudence since none of the things of the soul are either profitable or hurtful in themselves but they are all made profitable or hurtful by the addition of wisdom or of folly and therefore if virtue is profitable virtue must be a sort of wisdom or prudence meno i quite agree socrates and the other goods such as wealth and the like of which we were just now saying that they are sometimes good and sometimes evil do not they also become profitable or hurtful accordingly as the soul guides and uses them rightly or wrongly just as the things of the soul herself are benefited when under the guidance of wisdom and harmed by folly meno true socrates and the wise soul guides them rightly and the foolish soul wrongly meno yes socrates and is this not universally true of human nature all other things hang upon the soul and the things of the soul herself hang upon wisdom if they are to be good and so wisdom is inferred to be that which profits and virtue as we say is profitable meno certainly socrates and thus we arrive at the conclusion that virtue is either wholly or partly wisdom meno i think that what you are saying socrates is very true socrates but if this is true then the good are not by nature good meno i think not socrates if they had been there would assuredly have been discerners of character among us who would have known our future great men and on their showing we should have adopted them and when we had got them we should have kept them in the citadel out of the way of harm and set a stamp upon them far rather than upon a piece of gold in order that no one might tamper with them and when they grew up they would have been useful to the state meno yes socrates that would have been the right way socrates but if the good are not by nature good are they made good by instruction meno there appears to be no other alternative socrates on the supposition that virtue is knowledge there can be no doubt that virtue is taught socrates yes indeed but what if the supposition is erroneous meno i certainly thought just now that we were right socrates yes meno but a principle which has any soundness should stand firm not only just now but always meno well and why are you so slow of heart to believe that knowledge is virtue socrates i will try and tell you why meno i do not retract the assertion that if virtue is knowledge it may be taught but i fear that i have some reason in doubting whether virtue is knowledge for consider now and say whether virtue and not only virtue but anything that is taught must not have teachers and disciples meno surely socrates and conversely may not the art of which neither teachers nor disciples exist be assumed to be incapable of being taught meno true but do you think that there are no teachers of virtue socrates i have certainly often inquired whether there were any and taken great pains to find them and have never succeeded and many have assisted me in the search and they were the persons whom i thought the most likely to know here at the moment when he is wanted we fortunately have sitting by us anytus the very person of whom we should make enquiry to him then let us repair in the first place he is a son of a wealthy and wise father and thymion who acquired his wealth not by accident or gift like ismenius the theban who has recently made himself as rich as polycrates but by his own skill and industry and who is a well-conditioned modest man not insolent or overbearing or annoying moreover the son of his has received a good education as the athenian people certainly appear to think for they choose him to fill the highest offices and these are the sort of men from whom you are likely to learn whether there are any teachers of virtue and who they are please anytus to help me and your friend meno in answering your question who are the teachers 
Consider the matter thus. If we wanted Mino to be a good physician, to whom should we send him? Should we not send him to the physicians? Anatus. Certainly. Socrates. Or if we wanted him to be a good cobbler, should we not send him to the cobblers? Anatus. Yes. Socrates. And so forth. Anatus. Yes. Socrates. Let me trouble you with one more question. When we say that we should be right in sending him to the physicians, if we wanted him to be a physician, do we mean that we should be right in sending him to those who profess the art, rather than to those who do not, and to those who demand payment for teaching the art, and profess to teach it to anyone who will come and learn? And if these were our reasons, should we not be right in sending him? Anatus, yes. Socrates. And might not the same be said of flute-playing and of the other arts? Would a man who wanted to make another flute-player refuse to send him to those who profess to teach him the art for money, and be plaguing other persons to give him instruction, who are not professed teachers, and who never had a single disciple in that branch of knowledge which he wishes him to acquire? Would not such a conduct be the height of folly? Anatus. Yes, by Zeus, and of ignorance, too. Socrates. Very good. And now you are in a position to advise me about my friend Mino. He has been telling me, Anatus, that he desires to attain that kind of wisdom and virtue by which men order the state or the house and honor their parents and know when to receive and when to send away citizens and strangers as a good man should. Now, to whom should he go in order that he may learn this virtue? Does not the previous argument imply clearly that we should send him to those who profess and avouch that they are the common teachers of all Helas and are ready to impart instruction to anyone who likes at a fixed price? Anatus. Whom do you mean, Socrates? Socrates. You surely know, do you not, Anatus, that these are the people whom mankind call sophists? Anatus. By Heracles, Socrates, forbear. I only hope that no friend or kinsman or acquaintance of mine, whether citizen or stranger, will ever be so mad as to allow himself to be corrupted by them, for they are a manifest pest and corrupting influence to those who have to do with them. Socrates. What, Anatus, of all the people who profess that they know how to do men good, do you mean to say that these are the only ones who not only do them no good, but positively corrupt those who are entrusted to them, and in return for this disservice have the face to demand money? Indeed, I cannot believe you, for I know of a single man, Protagoras, who made more out of his craft than the illustrious Thadius, who created such noble works or any ten other statuaries. How could that be? A mender of old shoes or patcher up of clothes, who made the shoes or clothes worse than he received them? could not have remained thirty days undetected, and would very soon have starved, whereas during more than forty years Protagoras was corrupting all Halus, and sending his disciples from him worse than he received them, and he was never found out. For, if I am not mistaken, he was about seventy years old at his death, forty of which were spent in the practice of his profession, and during all that time he had a good reputation, which to this day he retains, and not only Protagoras, but many others are well spoken of, some who lived before him, and others who are still living. Now, when you say that they deceived and corrupted the youth, are they to be supposed to have corrupted them consciously or unconsciously? Can those who are deemed by many to be the wisest men of Halus have been out of their minds? Anatus, Out of their minds? No, Socrates, the young men who gave their money to them were out of their minds, and their relations and guardians who entrusted their youth to the care of these men were still more out of their minds, and most of all, the cities who allowed them to come in and did not drive them out, citizen and stranger alike. Socrates, has any of the sophists wronged you, Anatus? What makes you so angry with them? Anatus, no, indeed, neither I nor any of my belongings has ever had nor would I suffer them to have anything to do with them. Socrates, then you are entirely unacquainted with them. Anatus, and I have no wish to be acquainted. 
socrates then my dear friend how can you know whether a thing is good or bad of which you are wholly ignorant anytus quite well i am sure that i know what manner of men these are whether i am acquainted with them or not socrates you must be a diviner anytus for i really cannot make out judging from your own words how if you are not acquainted with them you know about them but i am not inquiring of you who are the teachers who will corrupt meno let them be if you please the sophists i only ask you to tell him who there is in this great city who will teach him how to become eminent in the virtues which i was just now describing he is the friend of your family and you will oblige him anytus why do you not tell him yourself socrates i have told him whom i suppose to be the teachers of these things but i learn from you that i am utterly at fault and i dare say you are right and now i wish that you on your part would tell me to whom among the athenians he should go who would you name anytus why single out individuals any athenian gentleman taken at random if he will mind him will do far more good to him than the sophists socrates and did those gentlemen grow of themselves and without having been taught by any one were they nevertheless able to teach others that which they had never learned themselves anytus i imagine that they learned of the previous generation of gentlemen have there not been many good men in this city socrates yes certainly anytus and many good statesmen also there have always been and there are still in the city of athens but the question is whether they were also good teachers of their own virtue not whether there are or have been good men in this part of the world but whether virtue can be taught is the question which we have been discussing now do we mean to say that the good men of our own and of other times knew how to impart to others that virtue which they had themselves or is virtue a thing incapable of being communicated or imparted by one man to another that is the question which i and meno have been arguing look at the matter in your own way would you not admit that themistocles was a good man anytus certainly no man better socrates and must not he then have been a good teacher if any man ever was a good teacher of his own virtue anytus yes certainly if he wanted to be so socrates but would he not have wanted he would at any rate have desired to make his own son a good man and a gentleman he could not have been jealous of him or have intentionally abstained from imparting to him his own virtue did you never hear that he made his son cleophantus a famous horseman and had taught him to stand upright on horseback and hurl a javelin and to do many other marvellous things and in anything which could be learned from a master he was well trained have you not heard from our elders of him anytus i have socrates then no one could say that his son showed any want of capacity anytus very likely not socrates but did any one old or young ever say in your hearing that cleophantus son of themistocles was a wise or good man as his father was anytus i have certainly never heard any one say so socrates and if virtue could have been taught would his father themistocles have sought to train him in these minor accomplishments and allowed him who as you remember was his own son to be no better than his neighbours in those qualities in which he himself excelled anytus indeed indeed i think not socrates here was a teacher of virtue whom you admit to be among the best men of the past let us take another aristides the son of lysimachus would you not acknowledge that he was a good man anytus to be sure i should socrates and did he not train his son lysimachus better than any other athenian in all that could be done for him by the help of masters but what has been the result is he a bit better than any other mortal he is an acquaintance of yours and you see what he is like there is pericles again magnificent in his wisdom and he as you are aware has two sons paralus and xanthippus anytus i know socrates and you know also that he taught them to be unrivalled horsemen and had them trained in music and gymnastics and all sorts of arts in these respects they were on level with the best and he had no wish to make good men of them nay he must have wished it but virtue as i suspect could not be taught 
and that you may not suppose the incompetent teachers to be the only meaner sort of athenians and few in number remember again that thucydides had two sons melissias and stephanus whom besides giving them a good education in other things he trained in wrestling and they were the best wrestlers in athens one of them he committed to the care of xanthius and the other of eudorus who had the reputation of being the most celebrated wrestlers of that day do you remember them anytus i have heard of them now can there be a doubt about thucydides whose children were taught things for which he had to spend money would have taught them to be good men which would have cost him nothing if virtue could have been taught will you reply that he was a mean man and had not many friends among the athenians and allies nay but he was of a great family and a man of influence as athens and in all halus and if virtue could have been taught he would have found out some athenian or foreigner who would have made a good man of his sons if he could not himself spare the time from cares of state once more i suspect friend anytus that virtue is not a thing which can be taught anytus socrates i think that you are too ready to speak evil of men and if you will take my advice i would recommend you to be careful perhaps there is no city in which it is not easier to do men harm than to do them good and this is certainly the case at athens as i believe that you know socrates o oh, meno think that anytus is in a rage and he may well be in a rage for he thinks in the first place that i am defaming these gentlemen and in the second place he is of the opinion that he is one of them himself but some day he will know what is the meaning of defamation and if he ever does he will forgive me meanwhile i will return to you meno for i suppose that there are gentlemen in your region too meno certainly there are socrates and are they willing to teach the young and do they profess to be teachers and do they agree that virtue is taught meno no indeed socrates they are anything but agreed you may hear them saying at one time that virtue can be taught and then again the reverse socrates can we call those teachers who do not acknowledge the possibility of their own vocation meno i think not socrates socrates and what do you think of these sophists who are the only professors do they seem to you to be teachers of virtue meno i often wonder socrates that gorgias is never heard promising to teach virtue and when he hears others promising he only laughs at them but he thinks that men should be taught to speak socrates then do you not think that the sophists are teachers meno i cannot tell you socrates like the rest of the world i am in doubt and sometimes i think that they are teachers and sometimes not socrates and are you aware that not only you and other politicians have doubts whether virtue can be taught or not but that theognis the poet says the very same thing meno where does he say so socrates in these elegiac verses theognis eat and drink and sit with the mighty and make yourself agreeable to them for from the good you will learn what is good but if you mix with the bad you will lose the intelligence which you already have do you observe that he seems to imply that virtue can be taught meno clearly socrates but in some other verses he shifts about and says theognis if understanding could be created and put into a man then they who were able to perform this feat would have obtained great rewards and again never would a bad son have sprung from a good sire for he would have heard the voice of instruction but not my teaching will you ever make a bad man into a good one and this as you may remark is a contradiction of the other meno clearly socrates and is there anything else of which the professors are affirmed not only to be teachers of others but to be ignorant themselves and bad at the knowledge of that which they are professing to teach or is there anything about which even the acknowledged gentlemen are sometimes saying that this thing can be taught and sometimes the opposite can you say that they are teachers in any true sense whose ideas are in such confusion meno i should say certainly not socrates but if neither the sophists nor the gentlemen are teachers clearly there can be no other teachers meno no socrates and if there are no teachers neither are there disciples meno agreed 
socrates and we have admitted that a thing cannot be taught of which there are neither teachers nor disciples meno we have socrates and there are no teachers of virtue to be found anywhere meno there are not socrates and if there are no teachers neither are there scholars meno that i think is true socrates then virtue cannot be taught meno not if we are right in our view but i cannot believe socrates that there are no good men and if there are how do they come into existence socrates i am afraid meno that you and i are not good for much and that gorgias has been as poor an educator of you as prodicus has been of me certainly we shall have to look to ourselves and try to find some one who will help in some way or other to improve us this i say because i observe that in the previous discussion none of us remarked that right and good action is possible to a man under other guidance than that of knowledge episteme and indeed if this be denied there is no seeing how there can be any good men at all meno how do you mean socrates socrates i mean that good men are necessarily useful or profitable were we not right in admitting this it must be so meno yes socrates and in supposing that they will be useful only if they are true guides to us of action there we were also right meno yes socrates but when we said that a man cannot be a good guide unless he have knowledge phrohonesis this we were wrong meno what do you mean by the word right socrates i will explain if a man knew the way to larissa or anywhere else and went to the place and led others thither would he not be a right and good guide meno certainly socrates and a person who had a right opinion about the way but had never been and did not know might be a good guide also might he not meno certainly socrates and while he has true opinions about that which the others knows he will be just as good a guide if he thinks the truth as he who knows the truth meno exactly socrates then true opinion is as good a guide to correct action as knowledge and that was the point which we omitted in our speculation about the nature of virtue when we said that knowledge only is the guide of right action whereas there is also right opinion meno true socrates then the right opinion is not less useful than knowledge meno the difference socrates is only that he who has knowledge will always be right but he who has right opinion will sometimes be right and sometimes not socrates what do you mean can he be wrong who has right opinion so long as he has right opinion meno i admit the cogency of your argument and therefore socrates i wonder that knowledge should be preferred to right opinion or why they should ever differ socrates and shall i explain this wonder to you meno do tell me socrates you would not wonder if you had ever observed the images of daedalus compare euthyphro but perhaps you have not got them in your country meno what have they to do with the question socrates because they require to be fastened in order to keep them and if they are not fastened they will play truant and run away meno well what of that socrates i mean to say that they are not very valuable possessions if they are at liberty for they will walk off like runaway slaves but when fastened they are of great value for they are really beautiful works of art now this is an illustration of the nature of true opinions while they abide with us they are beautiful and fruitful but they run away out of the human soul and do not remain long and therefore they are not of much value until they are fastened by the tie of the cause and this fastening of them friend meno is recollection as you and i have agreed to call it but when they are bound in the first place they have the nature of knowledge and in the second place they are abiding and this is why knowledge is more honorable and excellent than true opinion because fastened by a chain meno what you are saying socrates seems to be very like the truth socrates i do speak rather in ignorance i only conjecture and yet that knowledge differs from true opinion is no matter of conjecture with me there are not many things which i profess to know but this is most certainly one of them meno 
Yes, Socrates, and you are quite right in saying so. Socrates, and am I not also right in saying that true opinion leading the way perfects action quite as well as knowledge? Mino, there again, Socrates, I think you are right. Socrates, then right opinion is not a whit inferior to knowledge, or less useful in action, nor is the man who has right opinion inferior to him who has knowledge. Mino, true. Socrates, and surely the good man has been acknowledged by us to be useful. Mino, yes. Socrates, seeing then that men become good and useful to states, not only because they have knowledge, but because they have right opinion, and neither knowledge nor right opinion is given to man by nature or acquired by him. Do you imagine either of them to be given by nature? Mino, not I. Socrates, then if they are not given by nature, neither are the good by nature good. Mino, certainly not. Socrates, and nature being excluded, then came the question whether virtue is acquired by teaching. Mino, yes. Socrates, if virtue was wisdom or knowledge, then, as we taught, it was taught. Mino, yes. Socrates, and if it was taught, it was wisdom. Mino, certainly. Socrates, and if there were teachers, it might be taught, and if there were no teachers, not. Mino, true. Socrates, but surely we acknowledged that there were no teachers of virtue. Mino, yes. Socrates, then we acknowledged that it was not taught and was not wisdom. Mino, certainly. Socrates, and yet we admitted that it was a good. Mino, yes. Socrates, and the right guide is useful and good. Mino, certainly. Socrates, and the only right guides are knowledge and true opinion. These are the guides of men. For things which happen by chance are not under the guidance of man, but the guides of man are true opinion and knowledge. Mino, I think so too. Socrates, but if virtue is not taught, neither is virtue knowledge. Mino, clearly not. Socrates, then of two good and useful things, one which is knowledge has been set aside and cannot be supposed to be our guide in political life. Mino, I think not. Socrates, and therefore not by any wisdom, and not because they were wise, did Themistocles and those others of whom Anytus spoke govern states. This was a reason why they were unable to make others like themselves, because their virtue was not grounded on knowledge. Mino, that is probably true, Socrates. Socrates, but if not by knowledge, the only alternative which remains is that statesmen must have guided states by right opinion which is in politics what divination is in religion for diviners and also prophets say many things truly but they know not what they say meno so i believe socrates and may we not meno truly call those men divine who having no understanding yet succeed in many a grand deed and word meno certainly socrates then we shall also be right in calling divine those whom we were just now speaking of as diviners and prophets including the whole tribe of poets yet and statesmen above all may be said to be divine and illumined being inspired and possessed of god in which condition they say many grand things not knowing what they say meno yes socrates and the women too meno call good men divine do they not and the spartans when they praise a good man say that he is a divine man meno and i think socrates that they are right although very likely our friend Anytus may take offence at the word. Socrates, I do not care. As for Anytus, there will be another opportunity of talking with him. To sum up our enquiry, the result seems to be we are at all right in our view that virtue is neither natural nor acquired, but an instinct given by God to be virtuous, nor is the instinct accompanied by reason, unless they may be supposed to be among statesmen someone who is capable of educating statesmen and if there be such an one he may be said to be among the living what homer says that tiresias was among the dead he alone has understanding but the rest are flitting shades and he and his virtue in like manner will be a reality among shadows meno that is excellent socrates socrates then meno the conclusion is that virtue comes to the virtuous by the gift of god but we shall never know the certain truth until, before asking how virtue is given, we inquire into the actual nature of virtue. 
I fear that I must go away. But do you, now that you are persuaded yourself, persuade our friend Anatus, and do not let him be so exasperated. If you can conciliate him, you will have done good service to the Athenian people. End of Part 2 of the Dialogues of Mino Read for you by Chiquito Crasto, Birmingham, Alabama End of Mino by Plato Translated by Benjamin Jowett